What's up, nerds? The battle for Chassiv Yar has begun. And this follows a string of Russian victories in Avdivka and before that Bakhmut. But Chassiv Yar is the next town in line in this mountain range that we're going to talk about from Bakhmut. Uh, it's to the east of Bakhmut and it's kind of situated on, on, on the top of these rolling hills that are going to play a pretty significant role in this battle. So let's talk about how, when, and why Russia is going to attack Chassiv Yar, uh, as well as the implications from this battle and kind of what objectives both sides are setting with Chassiv Yar. I'm recording this video on April 16th, 2024. So let's go and get started. Now, firstly, we need to know that the geography plays a huge role in this area. It played a pretty big role in the Battle of Bakhmut, uh, and it's going to play a pretty big role in this battle as well. These two towns, they're in kind of these rolling hills in this part of Ukraine that have some pretty high highs, some pretty low lows and that allow forces to basically fire down on valleys. Bakhmut was situated in a valley between two hills, so that allowed defenders to attack not only on the town of Bakhmut, but also on forces that were trying to move into the into the city. So that became a pretty significant factor in the battle on, you know, whoever controlled the heights around Bakhmut controlled Bakhmut. Uh, likewise, Chassiv Yar sits on the top of the hills that kind of surround Bakhmut. So defenders are going to be able to fire down onto attackers and defenders or and attackers are going to have to basically fight their way up these hills. Now looking at the different maps, Russia is still working on trying to secure a foothold at the top of the hills. They're still fighting their way up through some of these spurs and draws to get up the hill and to get, you know, really towards the edge of town. But this is going to be a pretty significant fight. Not only does geography play a huge role uh, just in the rolling hills, but also in where Chassiv Yar is situated relative to other large urban areas. Chassiv Yar sits basically in this large urban belt that we're going to that's going to play a huge role, you know, in the war should the fight come to this belt. Uh, the next large town to the southwest is Konstantinivka. Uh, and again, guys, I'm going to try to pronounce these town names as best that as I can. Konstantinivka, I think I got that one right, but maybe I don't. Let me know in the comments. But that's roughly that town is roughly the size of Bakhmut, and it links the and it links highways 32 and 20. Uh, now, Highway 32 runs from Bakhmut down southwest towards Pokrovsk, kind of near-ish, you know, Zaporizhia and uh, you know the edge of Zaporizhia and Donetsk around about Stenax City, and uh, H-20 runs north through several other large towns in this urban belt. The H-20 runs through Druzhkova, Kramatorsk, and Slovyansk. Now there's also a rail connection that connects Bakhmut and Kramatorsk, and that rail connection runs through Chasov Yar. So Chas Chasov Yar is not only strategically important because it sits on these heights, it also is kind of that next town in line uh, in which, you, you know, Russia is going to want to take if it's going to want to take towns like Kramatorsk, Slovyansk, and Konstantinivka, which it certainly will want to. Those are very strategically, this is a very strategically important belt of towns. Now, while I mentioned that Bakhmut sat in a valley and Chasov Yar sits on hilltops, this whole urban belt, however, sits in a valley, basically, opposite this hill that Chasov Yar is sitting on. So, and you know, to the west of this urban belt, the geography starts to flatten out more considerably. However, a fight over this urban belt becomes a lot more complicated, similar to the Battle of Bakhmut, where, again, whoever controls the heights controls the town. Well, if we apply that principle further westward, then whoever controls the heights controls this urban belt. Well, Chasov Yar sits on the heights, and so for Russia to take control of the heights, they're gonna have to take Chasov Yar. Now, why this urban belt is very important, of course, we've talked about how Konstantinivka is very important because it connects the H-20 and H-32 highways. Uh, Slovyansk is just as important. Uh, it also connects a couple highways uh, from not only this urban belt, but also from Bakhmut and further northwest. Kramatorsk is also to the south of Slovyansk and ha has an airport. There's also a rail connection that runs through this urban belt along the H-20. Konstantinivka and Slovyansk joined three major highways, which is why Bakhmut had some importance, although it ended up not causing a massive breakthrough. It really does, however, allow Ukrainian troops in this area to, you know, reinforce this fight and supply this fight pretty readily. These are critical lines of communication to the front line. So for Russia to complicate, you know, the Ukrainian position here, they're going to have to either go for Konstantinivka or Slovyansk and really complicate 
you know, Ukrainian efforts to defend and resupply, forcing basically the Ukrainians to use, you know, smaller roads and side roads to resupply. Of course, it's going to take a lot longer. And in doing so, they're going to have to basically go to either of those towns and sever the H-20 and H-32 connections, at least put them under fire control, which is basically either line of sight or ability to hit them with aircraft or artillery. Now, Ukrainian general staff report that the Russian goal is to take Chasov Yar by May 9th, and that is a fairly ambitious goal for Russia, especially considering previous battles and how long those have taken. Uh, Think about the Battle of Bakhmut, for example. Even where, uh, even in Bakhmut, Russia had relative fire superiority, as is the case in most of the front line. Russia still had a very difficult time taking the town. They still had to rely on months long, you know, basically infantry based assaults. And that cost them tens of thousands of troops and several months of fighting before they were able to actually take Bakhmut. Now, Chasov Yar is not nearly as big as Bakhmut. Uh, it's much smaller, and the Ukrainian you know, military as a whole is in fairly worse shape than it was whenever it was fighting for Bakhmut. However, it still sits on geographically advantageous uh, positioning for Ukraine, and Ukraine doesn't have to hold Chasov Yar forever. Um, they really just need to hold long enough to inflict serious pain on the Russian forces while buying time for defenses to be completed to the southwest. And also getting more time for, you know, Western aid to hit the country. And we're going to talk about why that is important here in just a second. A battle for Konstantinivka, however, would be much more consequential. Because, again, it joins two major highways. Uh, It's kind of that, you know, that next large urban center and that urban loop. Uh, And so that's going to be a much, much larger battle. And it's probably going to mirror Bakhmut in many ways, uh, especially if Ukraine is able to get some kind of foreign aid, uh, replenish air defenses, for example, and, uh, you know, impact Russia's ability to launch airstrikes. We're going to talk about why that's very important here in just a second. But Ukraine might dig in for a fight in Chasov Yar, but they might be preparing really for a more stubborn defense southwest of time. So Chasov Yar, we could consider more as like a delay effort than and you know kind of a hard defense so it still matters let's not downplay that but it's it's, you know Chasov Yar isn't where things are going to start to break down Uh, Konstantinivka is where things are going to become much more you know strategically important for Ukraine now that's the strategic picture of Chasov Yar but what about the tactical picture in Chasov Yar you know why would a battle over Chasov Yar become incredibly deadly and why does Ukraine have opportunities here to inflict some serious pain Well, there are many small bodies of water in town. We've already talked about how, you know, the Russians are going to have to fight uphill. And that's a huge problem even today, a huge challenge even today. But, you know, throughout Chasov Yar, there are many small bodies of water like ponds, canals, uh, small creeks, that kind of thing. These might force Russia to basically channel their forces through more sturdy terrain that can accommodate heavier equipment. Infantry can still push through those areas that might be softer, like around those ponds, but they might have to be fighting without support at longer ranges. And this should sound familiar because this is something that we've seen in other fights, kind of like around Bakhmut. Now, the goal for Ukraine is basically to force Russia to channel their attack through these narrow passages that can accommodate heavier equipment and basically to make those areas kill zones. Uh, And that's basically, you know, anything goes in this area, we're going to kill it. Uh, And we're going to try to force the enemy to jam as much forces through this area as we can. And, you know, we're just going to mass fires on it and kill as many people as we possibly can, destroy as much equipment as we possibly can. Uh, the The capacity to sustain these kinds of kill zones, though, I think that's a bit of an open question. Artillery and ammunition shortages are a huge, huge problem right now. And you're going to need a lot of that. I mean, obviously, you can't have a kill zone if you don't have ammunition. Uh, so they're going to have to mass fires in a way that they've kind of been struggling to lately. Uh, and, you know, drones, of course, can play a big impact, but those only go so far. You know, you've got to be able to saturate an area with lead and death, basically, to, you know, put it that way. But the the... the there is a real impact from Russian precision airstrikes that's becoming a real issue. We've talked about, you know, their use of the Fab 1500 and how, you know, and smaller Fabs, how they've been able to basically convert dumb bombs into precision bombs with cheap glide kits. Uh, and that's becoming a huge issue for Ukraine. Uh, you know, they don't have to be pinpoint accurate. These bombs are big enough that, like, if they're within, like, a 10-meter, you know, range, then the, if they're within, like, a 10-meter zone... It's going to destroy everything. Like it, it, the, these are large bombs, right? 
And so, you know, being able to mass fires, but also being able to, you know, maintain a defensive position at all, they're going to have to come up with an answer for the Russian air threat. That's that's truly going to be a big problem. But of course, you know, Ukraine is uh, going to try to force Russia to expend as much manpower and munitions as possible on, on Chasov Yar. You know, hopefully, you know, for Ukraine, that will degrade the Russian ability to use those capabilities in the next fight. At the very at the very least, if they can force this Russian offensive that's looming to culminate in Chasov Yar, and I think that that's a fairly optimistic uh, goal to set, probably not that likely, then that would be a huge win for Ukraine. Even if, you know, the Russians take Chasov Yar, if the forces that they have to spend basically to take it basically completely, you know, mute their attack on Konstantinivka following, you know, Chasov Yar, I think that's a huge victory. So, of course, you know, Ukraine's going to have to just buy time as much as they can here in Chasov Yar, force Russia to spend as many of these fabs, as much equipment, as much, you know, manpower as they possibly can to, you know, in their attack on Chasov Yar. So that way what they have left to attack Konstantinivka is just, it's not as much as what Russia was hoping to play with. And, you know, they can force this offensive to culminate early. Now on the Russian objective for a May 9th victory over this town, and that depends very heavily on how this fight goes. The bombing campaigns with these fabs have been very effective so far. They've been able to drop a lot of these on Ukrainian positions. And, the you know, the, the testimonies from Ukrainians that... You know, they're not great. They, these fabs seem to be pretty effective and they can be a real problem, especially with, you know, more sturdy defenses where Russia can basically just demolish those defenses and that can become a, a real issue. Uh, Russia, you know, of course, is still have to rely on infantry based assaults uh, and elsewhere along the front line. But this is going to be another area where that's going to be the case on uh, the train might force them into even more infantry based assaults. Again, just dealing with the kinds of train that they're going to be fighting on. They're, they may also want to preserve some of their heavier equipment for a fight over Konstantinivka, uh, but they're not going to get there if they don't take Chasov Yar. So there's a balance to be struck here between how much equipment they're going to be willing to spend here in Chasov Yar and how much equipment that they can afford to not spend in Chasov Yar, pretty much. But of course, the Russian goal is to not get canalized, to not get funneled through these small areas that can become kill zones. Uh, and to do that, it will demand an infantry attack over, you know, terrain that uh, may not be able to handle heavier equipment. Basically to, you know, try to get into some of these defensive positions, uh, draw Ukrainian firepower away from those kill zones and, you know, try to dilute, you know, the Ukrainian defense in some of these areas. Fabs can enable, you know, these fab glide bombs can enable some of these attacks, uh, especially if they level the city beforehand. Now, I'm not quite sure, you know, if they're going to be successful in this attack by May 9th. Uh, that's just over three weeks away from the time of this recording. And again, it's, it's not a loss for Russia if they go past that deadline. But it definitely becomes more problematic if they fly past that deadline and they're suffering, you know, thousands or even tens of thousands of casualties similar to what they've suffered in previous battles. It's going to take us back to the need for Ukraine to get some of this aid that they've been really needing. Of course, that will allow Ukraine to buy time and inflict as much pain as possible here in Chasov Yar, which will enable them to basically meet a fight, make a fight over Konstantinivka and that urban belt even more of a nightmare. Um, and artillery can really help with, you know, this kind of fight. But at the same time, I think air defenses are this is really becoming kind of the bigger need, at least the higher payoff need, because th they need to prevent Russia from having the freedom to drop these fab glide bombs. They need to, you know, get longer range air defense systems uh, in place that they can attack, you know, the, the Russian aircraft that are dropping these glide bombs at a distance and, you know, basically kind of protect the defensive line and the defensive structures, not only in Chasov Yar, but more mainly in Konstantinivka. Because, you know, if, you know, Russia passes through Chasov Yar, you know, after however long it takes. And the defenses in Konstantinivka have been severely degraded because of the bombing. Then that's going to become a huge problem for Ukraine. So they've got to be able to defend against the Russian Air Force in a way that they haven't necessarily had to uh, in earlier you know, years of this conflict. It's not just about buying time in Chasov Yar. It's about preserving their defenses uh, and, and preventing Russia to be able to, to attack a degraded defense with the forces that they desire to attack with. And that's where we are with 
with Chassavyar as of right now. Of course, as more developments happen, we're going to come back and talk about this, um, and we'll continue to monitor and analyze this conflict as it goes on. So be sure to subscribe. I also want to hear your thoughts about not only you know Chassavyar, but really a larger fight in this area. You know, what are your thoughts on this? What do you think the Russian objectives could be, and how do you think that they're going to go about this? And you know, what do you think the impact of you know you you know further aid to Ukraine will be? on this kind of fight. So let me know your thoughts down in the comments and leave a like if you found this video helpful or informative and we will talk next time.